are beginning a, uh, a brand new series going through the parables of Jesus. And, uh, and I've been looking forward to, to going through this series as we focus on some of the stories that Jesus told to people to communicate principles about the, uh, the kingdom of God. Now, if you are new to, to church life or you're unfamiliar with this word parables, all that this means is a, a story or an illustration um, that is designed to help people understand a certain principle. And in particular, the, uh, the parables that Jesus told were designed to help people understand the kingdom of God. Now, when Jesus was here uh, on the earth, he spent three years ministering and teaching to people, and we have those, uh, those teachings recorded uh, in the four Gospels. And one of the primary things that Jesus taught about was the kingdom of God. Often this can be referenced in different ways. It might be referenced as the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven or just simply as, uh, as the kingdom. And he helped people understand what the kingdom of God was like how someone could be a part of it. What is it? And, uh, and the parables go a long way in helping us understand uh, the kingdom of God. Now, the way that, uh, that Jesus taught uh, often was through, uh, was through these parables, through stories. He would create characters and plots and timelines so that people could, uh, could understand the principles that he was, was trying to get across. Often what you see at the beginning of any of these parables is the kingdom is like. That's how, uh, how Jesus would begin uh, telling one of these, these stories. Now, if you've been in church uh, for any amount of time at all, you would have uh, likely heard myself or, uh, or another preacher using an illustration. So we would have uh, used an illustration to communicate a point. Now, the reason that we do this is not to simply uh, fill in some time or it's not like an ad break in the middle of, uh, in the middle of a sermon. The reason that we do that is, is to follow Jesus' example because Jesus, he would use illustrations to describe certain things about the kingdom of God to people and then he would, at the end of this uh, communicate the principle that he uh, that was being uh, that was being taught. There are over thirty parables that uh, that Jesus taught, but throughout this series, we're just going to be going through uh, seven of them, which will carry us through till the uh, till the end of November. Now, many of you will have uh, will have read. Um, some of Jesus' parables before. Even if you're joining with us and, uh, and maybe it's one of your first times to church, many of Jesus' parables are fairly familiar and they communicate uh, points that, that people um, are aware of. But one of the problems um, for some people in the way that they understand uh, the parables is that they simply view them as good moral lessons. So if you've heard someone say that they love Jesus' teaching, they think that Jesus was a really great teacher and that's all that he was, often the reason that people say that is because they are thinking of the, uh, of the lessons that Jesus taught through his parables. Now, if you simply take the approach of, uh, of viewing the parables as just good moral lessons, then you've fallen into a trap which, uh, which many people have come to, to call uh, moralistic therapeutic deism. Now, uh, this is a uh, very, very complex term that I'll, uh, I'll hope to, to help you uh, understand, but this is how some people view Christianity, that it's a uh, simply a, a belief system of, of morals, so how we live. It's a therapeutic belief. It's a belief that makes us feel better about ourselves. And a, it's a, a deistic belief. So it's one of these things that we believe that there is a, a God who exists, but there's no real involvement that he wants in our lives personally. There was someone a while ago who listed five different tenets of... Uh, of uh, um, 
moralistic therapeutic deism, which is the belief that a God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth, that God wants people to be good, nice and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and by most world religions, that the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem and that good people go to heaven when they die. And this is the mindset that many people approach uh, Jesus' parables with. And this happens if you separate Jesus' parables from the kingdom of God. But you notice that so often through the parables, Jesus prefaces it by, by saying, the kingdom of God is like, or the kingdom of heaven is like. And the parable that we're going to be looking at this morning uh, begins just in that way. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open up to Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Matthew 18, 21 to 35. It'll be up there on the screen as well. As I said, we must remember that this is uh, an integral part of, uh, of, the, uh, of the kingdom of God, how Jesus teaches here. Let's read together. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debts, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. When I was a, um, a child, um, I had a, uh, a real love for, for things in my, my bedroom being laid out a, uh, a certain way. I was very particular about my, my bedroom and I really didn't appreciate people going in my, my bedroom with, uh, without my permission. And this was something that unfortunately my, my brother and sister... Um, uh, they, they made the most of as, uh, as much as they could. My, my sister's uh, nine years older than me and my brother is six years older than me, so quite a, a fair bit older. And what they had a tendency to do when I was younger is they would go into my room and move everything. So if I wasn't around, this is uh, something that both my brother and sister love to do. But my brother and sister, or my, my brother, sorry, he, he decided to take it one step further um, after I, I was getting a little bit, bit aggravated with him. And he started putting shaving cream 
on everything in my room. And everything, I, I just couldn't believe that he was uh, this disrespectful to, to me. Now, this is a, quite a, uh, an amusing example of, um, of, uh, of a young person, which was, uh, which was me, and I was not able to forgive my, my brother and sister uh, in this moment. And sometimes when we think about the way that Jesus describes forgiveness, we may simply think of it in terms of a parent saying to their child, uh, saying to one child, you need to say sorry, and then they apologize, and then the next child needs to reply with, and now I, I forgive you. But that's not the sort of picture that Jesus is painting here about what forgiveness is supposed to look like. Do you notice right at the end of this, it speaks about forgiveness being from the heart. This is not just something uh, that we should be saying or speaking out. This is something that should be um, impacting us, us personally. Uh, a few years ago, there was a, uh, another time when, um, uh, when unfortunately, um, I had someone who, who I knew who was um, spreading gossip about me and saying lies about me to several other people. And in my heart, this is something that um, that grew anger and, and bitterness and resentment towards this person. And it's usually at this point that I would say to you, and, uh, and I was able to work through forgiveness by taking uh, these three steps. But unfortunately, I really, really struggled to forgive this person. It was hard, an uncomfortable thing for me to forgive someone who had been sharing lies about me. And this is someone who I had, had trusted as well. Now, I was able to, to forgive this person, but not until they had um, come to me and apologized to me. Now, the forgiveness that Jesus talks about here shouldn't actually even require and an apology. The uh, type of forgiveness that Jesus talks about here is an uncomfortable, radical type of forgiveness that, uh, that people should be, should be showing to one another. And I'm sorry to say that I, I didn't demonstrate this, this forgiveness as soon as, as I should have. Now, when I speak about this topic of, of forgiveness, I don't want to come at this lightly because I'm very aware that for some of you here in the room this morning, and some of you joining with us online, you have experienced real, genuine pain and hurt from someone else, far worse than I did. For many of you, forgiveness feels almost impossible because of the way that you have been wronged. So I don't want to make light of the way that, that many of you have, have been wronged in, in your life. This is a difficult thing, I understand, for, uh, for many people. And yet here, Jesus speaks about a new radical form of forgiveness that had never been experienced before. The way that this parable starts is with a question from Peter. And it feels like a perfectly reasonable question from, uh, from Peter. He's wanting to know, how many times am I able to, to forgive someone? How many times am I required to, to do this? Now, traditional rabbinical teaching at this time had been that you would forgive someone up to three times. That's the amount of times that you were commanded to forgive people. So when Peter comes to Jesus and says, should I forgive people seven times? He's trying to impress Jesus in saying this. He's saying, oh, should I forgive double plus one? Like, that's pretty impressive, isn't it, Jesus, to, uh, to forgive someone that amount? But Jesus' response to him is terrifying. It's shocking for the listeners at the time because Jesus' response is to say, look, it's not just seven times that you're supposed to forgive someone, but it's 77 times. A better translation is that it's 70 times seven. 
Now, when we look at those numbers, that doesn't mean if someone has wronged you and you need to forgive them, that you're supposed to sit there counting and marking down on a bit of paper, one, two, three, four, and all the way up to 490. The point that Jesus is trying to make here is continual forgiveness. It is something that doesn't stop. If someone wrongs you, continue to forgive them. Be a forgiving person. Uh, be a forgiving person. And this response is supposed to shock you. It should take you aback because originally having, uh, needing to forgive people just three times and now Jesus is saying unlimited, just continue to forgive. This would have been a shocking statement for the people at the time. And the language here is de- uh, that Jesus uses is designed to contrast a previous passage, which is in Genesis 4, uh, 24. In Genesis 4, 24, it speaks about avenging not just seven times, but 77 times. So when Jesus here is saying, forgive people this number of times, he is reversing this principle. He is saying, no, don't avenge things 77 times, but forgive that amount. Your attitude that you had towards vengeance, that should be your attitude instead towards forgiveness. And the people here as they were listening would have been shocked at this being a new principle for, uh, for, for people to, um, to take in, uh, in their life. And so Jesus goes on after this to describe to them in one of his parables... A, uh, a story to describe his, his point. And he uses an extreme example in this, uh, in this parable. The first servant, he is owing 10,000 uh, bags of gold. Some of your uh, translation, they, translations, they may say talents instead. And already here, when Jesus says 10,000 talents, the listeners would have thought, Wow, how could anyone ever owe that amount of money? That's a ridiculous amount to to be able to to owe. Now, I must admit that maths is not my strong suit. I don't enjoy maths very much at all. But for you, church, I loved you so much this week that I decided to do some some maths for you. So on the screen, we're going to see what this meant, uh, 10,000 talents. Uh, One talent was the equivalent of 20 years' wages. So this is where I I, I just felt so smart this week, is uh, 10,000 talents, well, 100,000 years' wages. Now, I decided, let's assume that someone earns $60,000 per year. This means that this man was owing $12 billion. It should have shocked the listeners at the time, and it should shock us. What a tremendous amount of money. I've written up there, it's a thousand times the annual revenue of Galilee, Judea, Samaria, and Idumea put together. A tremendous amount of of money. And then the servant, the first servant, says something that is ridiculous. Because he says, be patient with me. I'm going to pay it back. Don't worry, I'll, I'll work towards paying this back. Now, I hope you realise that if, um, if he uh, chose to, to pay it back, well, the master would still be waiting and would be waiting for another 198,000 years. So uh, that's a bit of a, a strange thing for him to say. Wait and I will be able to, to pay this back. And this is the system that is taught in most of uh, most different things in our in our world today. This is what systems in our world teach, and this is what different world views, apart from Christianity, teach as well. That if you give enough, and if you do enough, that you will be able to have your debts wiped clean. 
This is an incalculable amount of money, and yet the master, what is his response? To have pity on the servant and to forgive the debt. This is the bank that I want to, uh, that I want to get loans from. He wipes the slate clean. He forgives what should be the unforgivable debt. And the response of the first servant should be, wow, I've been forgiven so much. How could you possibly forgive that amount of of money? I must be sharing this this with others. I um, I played Monopoly with, uh, with a friend uh, with a friend once, and I, um, I don't really enjoy Monopoly as much as other people, but some people take Monopoly really seriously. Like, this is a game that seems to break friendships, and so for someone who doesn't take it very seriously, I love playing this with, with people, and during this game of Monopoly in particular, I was just destroying. I won this game by, uh, by a long way, and it was great to be able to, to beat someone who was taking this, this fairly seriously. And the reason that I was able to, to win this game so well is because I, almost at every point, got every single get-out-of-jail-free card that you can possibly get. I was, uh, I was happy with, with this. And I had another friend recently who was describing to me the, the way that this, this parable, parable works, that it is like Jesus, or it is like the master, sorry, handing out get-out-of-jail-free cards, an unlimited amount of get-out-of-jail-free get out cards to, to his servants. It's a uh, a good thing when you are playing this game and you get one of these cards. It feels almost like magic, like you were sent to to prison and then you are able to uh, to get out and uh, and continue along your your way. And for us as as Christians, this is our lived experience: is that whenever we sin against God, we are given a get out of jail free card. Again and again and again, there is an unlimited amount of these things that we are gifted as followers of Jesus. There is an unlimited amount of forgiveness. And the reason that this parable should be sh- so shocking for even those of us who are, who are followers of Jesus is because the debt is so great. And Jesus in this is speaking about people's debt, their sin against God. We shouldn't minimize our sin against an almighty, great, perfect God. We have sinned against an almighty God. But because of his great love and grace and forgiveness towards us, we are given unlimited get-out-of-jail-free cards, and we can have an eternity in paradise with Jesus. Our debt has now been paid. There is no earning of salvation that we have to do. We don't have to say to God, I will pay it back. Just wait for me to, to do the right amount of good works. Jesus already paid the debt for us when he died on the cross. He took the death that we could not die and he then rose again three days later, victorious over the grave, and now forgiveness is offered to every single one of us, even though our sin has been so great. That is an immense, incalculable amount of forgiveness that every single one of us has been offered, that your debt has been forever cancelled and you are out of jail, completely free. But the forgiveness of God is not just like receiving a get-out-of-jail-free card. The card shouldn't just benefit us. We are not just handed an unlimited amount of these cards just to get out of jail ourselves. It is something that we should then be giving 
to other people. And this is the second part of the, the parable that Jesus teaches. Because if we simply stop and only receive forgiveness, then we've missed the point of what Jesus is teaching here. Because the forgiveness that the servant has been given, it doesn't change his perception of, of anything towards other people. In verse 28, but when that servant went out, he found one of his servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. Now, once again, the extremes that Jesus uses here are designed to shock us. I went on and I did some more maths for us this, this week. Because the first servant, he owed the equivalent of $12 billion. But the second servant, he only owes about $15,000. The reaction of the second servant is exactly the same as that of the first, which is, just wait, be patient with me, and I will be able to pay back this debt. Now, this is still a large amount of money. $15,000 is no small amount of money. There is still a debt, but it is a debt that could have possibly been paid back. There is a wrong, but it's not the same level of wrong as that of the first servant. The way that Jesus describes this parable would have shocked the listeners at the time. They would have heard that the first servant had been forgiven from a $12 billion debt, and yet the second servant had no forgiveness from a $15,000 debt. And their thought process would have been, well, that first servant, he deserves justice. He should have forgiven that second servant. How couldn't, why couldn't he do that? And there is justice for the first servant. The master punishes the unforgiving, terrible heart of the, uh, of the first servant. And then right at the end of this parable, Jesus, he drops the hammer and he tells the people who are listening, this is not just a story that I am speaking about right now, this is about us. This is about you. This has to do with your forgiveness of your brothers and your sisters. Because you have ultimate forgiveness, you should be also offering unlimited amount of forgiveness to other people. He is saying to them that you are far more like the first servant than you realize. You shouldn't be stingy with forgiveness. You should be sharing it an unlimited amount. You should be handing out these get out of jail free cards to other people. Essentially, the big point that Jesus is trying to communicate is that being greatly forgiven leads to greater forgiveness. Being greatly forgiven by Jesus, which if you are a follower of Jesus, you have been greatly forgiven, this should lead to greater forgiveness. Team, do you just want to come up right now? That'd be great. We look at what Jesus has done for us and we receive his forgiveness. Us who have wronged an almighty God we understand that we have been deeply, amazingly, relentlessly loved by this almighty God and that we can rest in his forgiveness and grace, but then we are called to offer it to others who wrong us. On the 1st of February 2020, many of you would have seen on your TV screens a really um, devastating, uh, a devastating scene when you were um, watching the news, maybe. Because on the 1st of February 2020, there were four children who were killed in what was called the Oatlands Crash. Um, the, the Oatlands Crash, there was a, a guy who was um, drunk and drug driving, and, uh, and he ended up taking out uh, four, 
four young children who were just on the side of the road, and three of these children all belonged to the same family. And I've been watching interviews with the parents this past week and just watching their, um, their devastation at this news that over one night, um, three of their children were killed in a devastating, devastating thing. And out of this, the, um, the parents of these three children decided to, to start something which was called uh, I Forgive Day. They wanted to demonstrate the power of forgiveness for someone who had killed their three children. That is a tremendous amount of forgiveness for someone. And if you go on the website of, uh, of I Forgive Day, you'll see that the reason that they are doing this, the reason that they are, um, have started I Forgive Day was fueled by their love for Jesus. They're not doing it just, to, um, just as a, a moral act, but because they have received the love of Jesus and they want to share that with someone who has hurt them and affected their life in a, in a really profoundly negative way. And this has changed people's views on their understanding of of Jesus as they've seen these these people forgive. Now, as I speak about forgiveness this morning, as I said at the start of our, our time together, I really do understand that this is a difficult thing for many of you who have been gravely hurt by by someone. And so the very first step of offering forgiveness to someone else is to firstly accept forgiveness yourself. Accept the forgiveness that Jesus has offered you. And if you are here this morning or joining with us online and you don't know Jesus, you don't understand that level of forgiveness, there is no wrong, no amount of sin, nothing that could keep you far enough away from God's love that there is no forgiveness from you. You need to accept the forgiveness that God offers you because of what Jesus done has done on the cross. But after that, I just want to offer you a, a couple of things that you might choose to do today. You may choose to ask for forgiveness from someone else. Even as I'm saying this, there might be someone coming to your mind where you might realize that you have wronged someone, that you have hurt them, and maybe you need to ask for forgiveness from someone. Or you may need to offer forgiveness to someone who has wronged you. And that is hard, I do understand that. Whether that person has apologized to you or not, that's actually, that doesn't matter according to what Jesus says here. We are to offer forgiveness nonetheless. And I'm just going to give us a a moment, um, just as Deb's playing right now. Um, Every single one of you should have received communion on your way in. And this is part of us remembering the forgiveness that we have in Jesus. Um, But before you take this, I just want you to search your own heart and consider, are there elements of unforgiveness in your own heart? And I'm going to invite you to only take this when you can confidently say that there is not unforgiveness in your heart. If that means that you just need to hold on to this and have it later on at home, that's fine. But really search your heart during this time receive the forgiveness that Christ offers and have forgiveness um, realized in your own heart for, for other people.